Thank you one and all, especially to the uh, co-aiders and founders of Adathon and the GES uh, and, K and uh, SK Foundation. Uh, I think it's a wonderful opportunity you've given me as well as my colleagues to uh, present something about uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Just before I continue, I'd like to introduce uh, what I would, uh, whom I would call panelists because I will make a presentation at the beginning and uh, when we come to the discussions, probably our panelists from our hospital could uh, add on valuable information for the benefit of the participants. Dr. Sindhulina Chandra Singh is a head of microbiology services and uh, she is involved in doing lab tests in bacteriolo bacteriology, serology, uh, including autoimmune diseases, mycobacteriology, and she's a quality manager of the laboratory. And she has special interests in uh, multiple areas, including TB, streptococca, and the recently coronavirus uh, disease. We also, I don't know if Dr. Abhijit has joined. He's actually our joint replacement orthopedic surgeon. He specializes in joint replacement. And uh, he has got multiple papers to his name. And his primary aim is to give a safe uh, medical care to his patients. And he specializes in joint surgery. And I've got a few slides uh, based on that. We also have another doctor panelist called Dr. Vinita. She's a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist. Uh, and as we uh, in Baptist Hospital, and she has many years of experience uh, in dealing with rehabilitation and uh, its uh, various aspects. Now, quickly to go on to the topic uh, at hand. Um, as you know, about a five days ago, esteemed Dr. Navtej has already covered quite a bit of uh, the disease, the medical aspects. Uh, right from the history, he has taken it uh, forward in a very erudite lecture all the way to diagnostic aspects, clinical features, investigations, management. So uh, to a large extent, I would say he has done most of the work in, in laying the groundwork, so to speak, about the disease uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So I thought I would uh, take it in a little different level. Uh, focusing more on illustrations, pictures, and maybe a little bit more into uh, technology which uh, clinicians are using. <laughs> we are the end users, but we are not uh, very, obviously for obvious reasons, we are not expert in those areas. So this presentation will focus on various aspects that have a research potential of interest to both uh, uh, scientific, technological, engineering, and math students, as well as medical graduates who are in this group. So wonderful quote by uh, Mr. Nelson Mandela. He said, it's in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. And I believe the originators and founders of this foundation have done just that by making use of the available talent pool and potential in order to harness it for a better world in, uh, in this particular uh, aspect of uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis as well as inflammatory bowel disease. The conventional greeting Namaste, we are all familiar with it. And uh, I had a certain purpose in putting up this greeting. What we all consider normal, I would say rheumatoid arthritis patients, especially those who have had the misfortune of being diagnosed late into the illness, they are actually unable to do this very basic greeting. They struggle with this uh, angulation that the hand requires for a very basic namaste. So uh, that's the reason why I put this up in addition to it being a greeting to all of you. So I'll just quickly touch upon certain aspects of rheumatoid arthritis. It is chronic. Every word is important. It's systemic as in multi-system. It affects multiple organs of the bodies of the body, it's inflammatory and of unknown cause because we don't have a single cause for rheumatoid arthritis. It's environmental, genetic, uh, as and uh, as Dr. Navtej had already discussed. And the primary target of this disease is, as the name indicates, arthritis, uh, medically what we call synovial or joint tissues. 
It has a variable clinical course, and you will see patients at all stages of the disease, uh, especially medical people who come across this, may find very, very uh, early stages of the disease or very advanced stages of the disease. What is most common is that it is insidious over the course of weeks to months and affects predominantly the joints. Some patients have fever and fatigue and weight loss, which can be quite remarkable up to 20, 25 kgs of weight loss if they are not detected early. And the less common presentations are very aggressive course of disease. I do come across patients, maybe one in a hundred, who have only five to six weeks of arthritis, but they are rolled in on a wheelchair. And it's a very sad state of affairs. But that is maybe one to two percent of our patients fortunately, uh, with such an aggressive disease. And a majority of them actually come in with a low-grade progressive disease. You can have single joint, but it's extremely rare. And you can have few joints, what we call oligoarthritis, where four or less joints are involved. And there are very few, uh, few people who actually come to different departments because they have fluid in the lungs, or they've got a rash, and they end up in the dermatology service. Uh, and they actually have rheumatoid arthritis, They've been seeing another doctor for it and they think that these new manifestations uh, don't belong to this rheumatoid arthritis, so they attend other departments for help. So it's what we call extra-articular or non-articular manifestations. Articular stands for joints. So these are less common presentations, but we should be aware of it. This is a very uh, traditional picture. It's historically been there on the net. If you just click rheumatoid arthritis on Google, you will find an image like this. I put it up to tell, or to convey the message that this is not the stage to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis. This is not the stage at which clinicians should be seeing a patient. This is a very advanced stage of the disease. Medical students will know what this is. So I just put it up for a few seconds for people to guess. It looks a lot like what we see in the animal world and therefore it's called a swan neck deformity, a swan neck deformity. And this is one of the prime features of very advanced rheumatoid arthritis. Um, as I said before, I'm just focusing on a few images that will stay, which I would like to leave in the minds of our students and our engineering um, uh, faculty students, because um, this is not what we should be uh, dealing with. Hopefully, 10 years down the line, we will not be seeing any of these. But for those who do have these uh, deformities, those who do have these problems, uh, we need to find solutions and I'm coming to that by the end of the presentation. So basically rheumatoid arthritis causes a stretch on this aspect, what we call the proximal interphalangeal joint. And there is a normal ligament here which is uh, inflamed and it gets torn. And as a result of it, you have a abnormal extension of this joint. And then the ligaments here pull this, what we call the distal interphalangeal joint down. And that's what creates this deformity called a swan neck uh, deformity. Of course, it is not uncommon to see this in some neurological diseases for the, re for the reason that it is uh, when the nerves are supplying these joints are weak, you can have these deformities. The difference is how do you differentiate it from a rheumatoid arthritis is when it is a neurological disease like cerebral palsy or Parkinson's disease, they don't have pain in the joints, whereas if it's rheumatoid, they'll have pain and inflammation and early morning stiffness, which is a term we commonly use for inflammatory joint disease. This is another deformity which has a more obscure name, but I'm putting it up because all medical students are questioned on this in their viva and maybe on their OSCE exams. And this is for the information of non-medical uh, uh, students, this is called a proximal interphalangeal joint. Phalanx means uh, the finger and the proximal, the first early joint and the distal joint. It's called a DIP or distal interphalangeal joint. So this deformity is called, uh, uh, for, for obscure reasons, it's called a buttonhole uh, or a butonier deformity, which is a French word, and describes the arrangement of flowers in a buttonhole of a coat lapel, as you can see here, which is commonly seen at weddings or funerals. Here again, uh, it will be of interest uh, to our science graduates that everything boils down to physics. You can see how this, uh, uh, this ligament called a central slip in the finger is supposed to maintain the integrity of this joint. 
the joint is here in between but there's a slip that comes in here supposed to maintain the integrity of this joint but when that slip is broken because the joint disease progresses this is why we call it a progressive disease the area here is the joint it progresses and damages this central slip and the finger becomes irreversibly flexed and that leads to what's called this butonia deformity another deformity is uh, what we see in this is the image of a wrist joint and um, there is a name for it again medical students need to know it and it is uh, this uh, this is the hand and this is the wrist and this is the forearm there's a you can see a lump over here basically the joint uh, ligaments because of added, uh, uh, ongoing inflammation the ligaments have become weak and this radio means radius nothing to do with radio uh, radius uh, this bone and this uh, uh, this the two bones of the forearm are called radius and ulna and this joint becomes weak and they, it goes out of position it's subluxated or displaced so it's uh, known as something called piano key deformity it is used as an indicator of this joint instability i'm highlighting these things mainly because these are what our warriors are suffering with not because of anything they have done it is the only culprit i think dr navdeep would have discussed it the only environmental culprit that we can uh, find fault with is smoking in males but for all practical purposes uh, the uh, uh, the number of smokers we see with this disease are so rare so we have no real explanation why so many women come with this but these are the these are the deformities that uh, make life miserable for day to day activities this is another deformity which medical students should identify here this is the thumb we call it the first metacarpophalangeal joint this is the uh, these joints over here are called the uh, metacarpal metacarpal phalang the, the joint connecting the fingers to this uh, to this sorry to to the uh, the the hand are called first metacarpophalangeal joint so it's actually here at this point uh, the thumb is deformed in what we call a what is traditionally called a z thumb deformity it's also called hitchhiker's thumb for practical for obvious reasons it's called a z thumb uh, and this again is displacement inflammation in the joints which cause an irreversible deformity and therefore patients are not able to appropriate the opposing action of the thumb against the fingers which is all important for grip and function that's why this is important for them so we have a summary of hand findings because rheumatoid arthritis patients even today you even now i see patients who come for the first time in this 2022 i see patients who come into my opd with deformities because they have not been even if they have been diagnosed they have not got the appropriate treatment uh, many of our patients unfortunately go to various alternative systems and the point is they don't stick to that system they keep changing and they still even in this day and age come uh, in our uh, society we see patients who come with deformities and this is just what i described um, the deviation uh, deformities in the hand one is called an ulna deviation where the hand the wrist is deviated towards the body another one is a swan neck uh, then the button hole hole deformity and because of rupture of tendons you can actually lose function of individual fingers fortunately it's very rare but these are all seen in advance from rheumatoid arthritis these are x-ray findings and uh, just to explain it a bit over the years and this is not the right time to diagnose it this is probably 5 to 6 years into the illness over the years patients you can see any untrained eye who looks at this x-ray can say these fingers are all out of place uh, and uh, this is because of the a uh, displacement of joints due to many years of inflammation and the bones because of inflammation they undergo loss of bone density we call it osteopenia or osteoporosis you get erosions like you see here in the uh, in the joints uh, bones are actually literally eaten off and a complete loss of alignment of the bones these is these are the advanced stages and this is not a diagnostic uh, Uh, it, it's a it's an X-ray for diagnosis, but this should not be the stage in which we diagnose our patients. If it does happen, it's very late. So those are the clinical and the imaging aspects of um, rheumatoid arthritis. I thought I would just touch upon the laboratory diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. I'm not going into all the uh, secondary tests. I'm only going to focus on the primary tests. And all our students should be aware that there are two important tests called. Uh, both are antibodies 
and these antibodies as you know are good for us but these are unwanted antibodies or auto antibodies which are directed against our own antibodies and they are found in up to 80% of patients during the course of their disease that's why they call auto antibodies uh, i'll come to the acpa but rheumatoid factor is an important and test which has been a important test which has been around for at least uh, four or five decades and uh, it's important to do both the tests and although rheumatoid factor was the traditional one uh, um, uh, it is also seen in other diseases so it's important i just want to highlight this uh, medical students as well as engineering students that rheumatoid factor should not be ordered um, just like that or interpreted in the setting of an isolated lab test it has only a moderate specificity so you could have uh, false positives uh, because other autoimmune diseases and infections uh, these are two autoimmune diseases i've just mentioned for brevity systemic lupus erythematosus primary sjogrens these are diseases which cause arthritis but they're not rheumatoid arthritis but they also have this antibody rheumatoid factor levels are also elevated in certain common infections like malaria and uh, rubella and hepatitis c and even after certain vaccination so we should interpret these antibodies with uh, clinical correlation then comes the all important test called anti citrullinated peptide so basically when we call when we talk about citrullination citrullination is a normal process that happens when proteins in our body are degraded in a process called uh, apoptosis or spontaneous cell death so for some reason 20 years ago uh, researchers found that uh, these uh, rheumatoid patients have antibodies to these uh, peptides which are normally citrullinated and these are called auto antibodies unwanted antibodies which are just generated and uh, antibodies um, which are not supposed to be there are formed in these patients and so they are actually antibodies to these peptides which are normally being broken down by the process of what is called citrullination that is as simple as i could make it but that's why it's called anti citrullinated peptide antibodies it's also called ccp in in many uh, uh, in in uh, in several literature you will find another term but it's basically the same cyclic citrullinated peptides and this is all important because this is uh, very specific if a patient is ccp positive it's almost 99% sure that he has rheumatoid arthritis whereas rheumatoid factor is different which was the conventional test the rheumatoid factor sensitivity is around 80 to 85 so there's about 15% chance that he does not have rheumatoid arthritis if you go only with the rheumatoid factor so most uh, modern uh, criteria or rather the latest the criteria which dr navtej alluded to by the european and american associations called the uh, rheumatoid ular acr criteria they use both uh, because if both are positive both the tests are positive it's very likely that the patient has rheumatoid arthritis almost with a 99% certainty so it's why is it important because uh, it's very useful in the early diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis as i started off showing you very grim looking pictures i would like to highlight that we should make a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis in a patient who comes about 5 to 6 weeks after symptoms uh, why do i wait for 5 to 6 weeks because the normal the usual chick not normal the usual chikungunya and the viral arthritis uh, or the uh, viral fever related joint pains come and go in about 6 weeks so if you have persisting joint pains more than 6 weeks you would be justified in doing these tests and if you can get an acpa test or a ccp test positive that's the time to refer the patient to a rheumatologist general physicians over the decades have done a great job in managing rheumatoid arthritis but rheumatologists are the specialist physicians who focus on multiple autoimmune diseases and uh, auto, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is probably the most common disease we see and therefore for that degree of expertise it's uh, in this day and age it's good to uh, first get a, a rheumatologist referral if not a, a physician should see the patient and then refer to a general physician and then further on to a rheumatologist because with the new learning and the increased vast explosion of knowledge there are several uh, ways to make um, uh, a very effective and impactful treatment to improve the quality of life of these patients so it's very important to get this test done in about 6 to 7 weeks after the patient comes uh, from the onset of symptoms you don't have to wait 2 years to do this test you can do it within a 2 months of symptoms 
uh, as I said, anti-CCP has some false positives, so it's always a clinical correlation and it can be seen in other diseases. And unfortunately, even in tuberculosis, which is uh, endemic in our country, uh, few patients have positive results. But of course, tuberculosis patients don't come up front with arthritis, they come with cough and fever. So we need to interpret symptoms based on the clinical setting. So I'll just put it briefly, the summary of the rheumatoid tests are mainly rheumatoid factor and CCP. It's better to do both. Um, don't do it blindly. Uh, there is a very bad practice uh, in our country, in our society. We see multiple labs just ordering arthritis panels for general master checkup, which is not wise because many of these patients may have a false positive. As you can see, this third line, anti-CCP occurs in 1.5% or less of healthy population. So if you do a thousand um, tests, you can see that at least a hundred of them uh, we, we, sorry, our 10 or 15 of them will actually turn positive and that leads to a lot of anxiety and they may not even have arthritis. So it's not good to include these tests in a, in a master checkup, for example. Um, why is anti-CCP important? Apart from the early diagnosis, it's very important because it, it predicts joint erosion and that is actually not good and they should be seen by a rheumatologist before the joint erosion sets in. Finally, um, uh, uh, coming to the tests, we need to all good hospitals or rather uh, uh, secondary care hospitals, I would say, um, uh, would have uh, this machine called an automated ELISA equipment, enzyme-linked li enzyme immunosorbent assay, where antibodies are detected using, and this is specifically for the anti-CCP antibody. This is just a, a picture of the equipment that we have. Uh, Dr. Sindulina may clarify a little bit more on this uh, if the participants have questions, but this is the kind of equipment that we need. I'm, I, I'll come to the, uh, uh, the importance of this, uh, of this presentation uh, a little later. As you can see, this machine is several lakhs and it needs to be installed, uh, which is probably not so convenient in uh, 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 far-flung or remote settings. This is another equipment called the nephilometry equipment for just for the rheumatoid factor testing. It's also used for other things. It's not only for this, but I, I'm highlighting it here because it's in the context of rheumatoid arthritis. So nephilometry, as uh, biotech students will know, is a principle where immunoglobulins or these antibodies, uh, the concentration of these antibodies can be picked up by passing a light source and the light scatter is used to, uh, the uh, looking at the light scatter, you can actually calculate the concentration of these uh, antibodies. So it, this is all very technical. We don't have uh, too much understanding of this. Uh, a card, it's actually a test uh, reader. It just puts out the report for us and we get the report. But I put this up because this is the gold standard for doing a rheumatoid factor test. And this automated ELISA equipment is a gold standard to test the anti-CCP antibody. So coming to prognosis, I, I am not going too detailed or, uh, into details of treatment because drugs uh, have gone to the very highest level as Dr. Navte has already highlighted. He has put out uh, all the uh, conventional uh, disease modifying agents as well as uh, Dr. Navtej has, uh, has briefly touched upon what we call cytokine therapies where targeted um, treatments are available but unfortunately many of them are out of the uh, are quite expensive. Uh, so he has already discussed that so in order to avoid repetition I'm just going straight into the prognosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Point number one it's a lifelong progressive disease but a very important uh, thing to take away from this talk is that progression is preventable to a large degree. And that's why we are all here today. That's why I'm giving this talk because I want everybody to understand uh, in this group to know that progression is preventable to a large degree with good treatment. A uh, few things to remember that people who do have the CCP antibody have a more aggressive disease. That's why the treatment needs to be stepped up and we do not follow a slow wait and watch policy. The treatments about 30 years ago was to start a single drug, wait for response for three months, then add the second drug, and then wait for response for another three months. But nowadays with the CCP, we can add on multiple therapies at the same time in order to get faster recovery. As I've said here, joint erosions occur within the first one to two years. Erosion means the bone is literally eaten away. It's very, it's very uh, small. You cannot really see it on an X-ray. Um, but uh, X-rays picked up much later by about five years. Joint erosions can be seen by MRIs and ultrasound, which Dr. Navtej had touched upon. But 
Since these erosions occur within two years, we cannot go in a step-by-step -step pattern. If you have a patient with CCP antibody, you actually have to institute multiple therapies at the same time in order to give them a near normal life uh, in their, uh, 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 as the disease uh, is something that needs long-term treatment. So 50% of rheumatoid arthritis patients stop working after 10 years if they're not treated correctly. And as you know, many patients present in their 30s and 40s, and if they have to stop working at, 50, at the age of 40 or 50, that's a disaster. Early DMARDs are essential. Message I would like to leave is that RA is eminently treatable, but it needs regular medication and follow-up with the rheumatologist. Uh, just a few con uh, slides on concluding on rheumatoid arthritis. It is, we have other diseases which look like rheumatoid arthritis since the focus of this foundation and Idathon is on rheumatoid arthritis just to open up uh, the uh, vista for everybody. There are other diseases which look a lot like rheumatoid arthritis. So that's why it's important to meet an experienced physician or a rheumatologist because other diseases need to be ruled out when you talk about rheumatoid arthritis. I mentioned it here, spondyloarthritis. Uh, it's called seronegative because these rheumatoid factors will be negative, but there are, they have other features. They can have a skin condition called psoriasis, and that can cause arthritis very similar to rheumatoid arthritis. You can have reactive arthritis triggered by a recent infection of the bowel, urinary tract, or sexually acquired infections. They can also present with uh, aggressive arthritis. Then you have uh, inflammatory bowel disease. One third of inflammatory bowel disease patients also have uh, arthritis. That's why it's called enteropathic because of the gut and joint linkage. Then you have other viral arthritis, which many of us are familiar with, especially chikungunya, other connective tissue diseases, as I mentioned. So it's not all arthritis is not rheumatoid arthritis. That's the purpose of this slide. Psoriatic arthritis is much easier to diagnose because you have clinical features. The patient actually shows skin manifestations, and that will help you to know. Uh, about 10% of psoriatic arthritis patients may have rheumatoid factors, but when they have skin changes, we treat it as psoriatic arthritis. It's important to know this. Coming to uh, surgical aspects of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, on our panel we have Dr. Abhijit who will probably enable, uh, uh, will uh, uh, help us with the inputs on this um, um, aspect of the disease. So I'll just briefly go through this. As you know, arthritis in its advanced stages leads to loss of function, limitation of mobility and permanent, unfortunately permanent disability. And these are the various uh, aspects of the body that can be involved, but the point is this is an early stage uh, of the disease. Why is it early? Because the patient's knees are not yet deformed. What you're seeing, the swelling on the upper portion of the left knee um, is actually a water or infusion, what we call fluid effusion. It goes on to cause damage to cartilage and finally ends, in, ends up in deformity. These are advanced changes of rheumatoid arthritis. This is a real patient in Baptist who came with a, uh, a flexion deformity of her knee and Dr. Abhijit and team were able to replace her knee. This was a x-ray of her knee before surgery. And you can see there is a lot of loss of joint space. There's no space between the joints. And this is a very advanced stage of the disease. And uh, post-surgery, she did well. We don't have, sorry, I don't have images of her post-surgery. But uh, uh, just to come down to a, just an, a picture from the net, this is what this deformity does to patients. This flexion deformity in the knee affects their gait, the strength of muscles, the other joints, hip joint, ankle joint. So it's, it leads to so many issue, uh, complications in other joints. So early intervention at this point means a knee replacement. You can see this patient has had a double knee replacement and you can see the immense difference it has made to her life. Coming to, uh, I, I just took this direct talk in the direction of uh, uh, surgical treatments because uh, there are wonderful surgical remedies to improve uh, movement. As you can see, this is what a cartoon of a joint before treatment and this is after uh, a replacing with a implant which is also called a prosthesis. It is just a cartoon. I will come to the details. So you have a cobalt chromium alloy femoral component. This is the upper part and then you have a titanium alloy base plate and you have uh, its uh, materials are mentioned here. Highly cross-linked polyethylene base here is in this middle portion. Uh, to avoid friction at this point because metal on metal is not good. So this is the standard total knee replacement processes. These are the parts of a total knee replacement kit. You have the femoral component for the uh, thigh bone, the end of the thigh bone called the, uh, the thigh bone is also known as the femur, the femur and the femoral component which, uh, which, compromise, uh, which constitutes the knee joint is uh, the surface is completely replaced. The disease surface here, this is the leg component, the tibial plate 
and this is the polyethylene insert to prevent friction uh, between metal on metal and this is the knee cap which can be it is optional it's not used by all surgeons and then you have the uh, mallet which is actually used for hammering these implants into the bone so there are various areas of research available uh, sorry areas of research which are uh, which are uh, wanting uh, we need materials which uh, which uh, cause reduce wear and tear of the metal and uh, to prevent uh, we need better robotic surgical methods to minimize the manual bone resection um, we need to uh, restore accurate alignment of the new joint uh, we need tailor made prosthetic joints preoperative computerized planning uh, reduces errors in these implant fits or the size of these uh, joints. As you know, these surgeries may cost up to one to one and a half uh, lakhs, 100, 150,000 rupees. So it's important to get uh, a good fit and computerized uh, technology would really help in that. And of course, we need good materials which are biocompatible uh, to reduce infection rates. And silver coated implants are very good, but are very costly. So the material science uh, uh, aspect, time tested, Chromium, cobalt, uh, molybdenum alloys are the standard of care. Later modifications that are being used are oxinium or zirconium oxide and uh, what is known as gold knee. Uh, it's not actually gold, it's gold painted. Uh, it is actually a titanium niobium nitride coating. And um, these are the, actually the criteria needed for good implants. Um, these are the things that we need and these are areas for research. We need things with outstanding bio uh, implants with bio, outstanding biocompatibility, hardness superior to present day materials, uh, low friction, avoiding inflammation and uh, prosthetic or implant loosening. We need uh, good adhesive strength of the implant so that it doesn't loosen from the bone. And we need implants that are, uh, don't cause allergy and also implants that uh, can be used in younger patients because as I said, rheumatoid arthritis affects younger people and therefore younger and when they have many more years of good life it's better to replace damaged joints early this is the new uh, technology zirconium oxide which is a coating over the is an actual live uh, patient the coating of that uh, femoral component with this oxide coating uh, is, is something that improves the function and this is the gold uh, knee which is not used much because of the uh, cost and uh, it is eight times harder than a regular chromium cobalt product and then you have ceramic which is mainly used in the hip uh, but it performs very well in hip but not yet it's still in the experiment stages for the knee uh, this is the computer navigated knee replacement uh, these are all possible and available these days for better uh, effic efficacy and accuracy and much better surgical outcomes and these are the robotic knee replacement techniques which are available widely in 10 to 12 centers in india so you have computers and robots available. The surgeon is not missing in the picture. Surgeons need to open the joint and program the robots to do the surgery. And uh, these are the equipments. And I'm sure uh, it is an eye opener to even to medical students, even a few years ago when uh, these things were not available. And this is where technology has taken us, but we need to look at making it available to the wider population. Finally, for those who can't uh, go for surgery, for those who have difficulty in managing day to day, uh, uh, function we need to have rehabilitation or adaptive devices to help this on the left side is the key holder you should be able to fit a key into this holder rheumatoid arthritis patients cannot flex their fingers they cannot close their fist so they need a special wide handled uh, spoons this is actually something to help them put on their shirt buttons it's a button uh, hook uh, to help them put on their buttons these are all devices which are available polypropylene splints which are helping people to write you don't have to stop writing if you have rheumatoid arthritis and reach this stage unfortunately surgical treatments at this stage are quite uh, uh, almost uh, not possible so implants are the best you have uh, things to preserve function of the thumb you have this butonia deformity which i mentioned earlier it has to be worn these splints basically have to be worn most of the time ex except uh, things like writing which are used only for those functions and finally uh, my closing slide this is the Ankle foot orthosis or the support for the ankle, not so common in rheumatoid arthritis, but these are the things which are uh, needed uh, technology support. Uh, because as I said, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are on a forum or on a platform where we are discussing, as our esteemed director of uh, IIT had mentioned in the earlier session, this is the interface between engineering and medicine and we need to work on this. And uh, 
as a final slide i i would think that an area which needs a new technology is software applications that are multilingual in all major indian languages the classification criteria of rheumatoid arthritis uh, on the app so that patient specific apps are created and suitable for use by general practitioners as well as other non rheumatologists in far flung areas of the country the other thing that could really need uh, uh, development is point of care testing kits that do not need very heavy laboratory equipment this will enable portability and which is practical and reliable for use even in remote settings thank you and uh, once again uh, i would like to acknowledge my colleagues my esteemed colleagues at bangalore baptist hospital who are with me on the panel today surgical aspect slides were presented by dr abhijit rehabilitation assisted device slides by dr vinitha vargis a uh, diagnostic and autoimmune test slides by dr sindulina and my friend dr rajnish samal who is a consultant in obstetrics and gynecology who keeps me busy because he keeps calling me for his patients who are pregnant and also have rheumatoid arthritis dr rajnish facilitated this talk with the help of the co-editors of aid kriya and the founding members of uh, gnskd foundation thank you to the gnskd foundation members iit europa faculty mentors and all students and interns of ida thorn 22 so with that i would uh, like to open this floor for discussion or questions yeah you can uh, dr jacob you yes, can uh, raise uh, the screen so that you know all the pictures can be in one one place here yeah. you can just uh, cross the share presentation thing yeah that that button here yeah. oh yeah Yeah, brilliant. Yes, yes. As I said, I have not repeated uh, the things which Dr. Navtej has spoken. It's a recorded session. Dr. Navtej session is very erudite, and it contains everything from A to Z about rheumatoid arthritis. I've taken this presentation a little more towards uh, technology platform because these are areas where we, the end users, uh, need to be knowledgeable, and of course, our patients will benefit immensely. with newer technologies and of yeah. course uh, we need to keep in mind our uh, majority of our patients are still in the rural areas and we need to keep them in mind uh, these technologies are not yet available to them predominantly because of the cost concerns uh, but we need to develop affordable and uh, economic technologies that enable early diagnosis and treatment yes yeah, so so dr jacob dr rajnish dr vinitha dr abhijit dr sindulina i think before anybody asks question i must just express my thanks and gratitude that uh, all of you could find time on a saturday evening uh, and leaving time beside for your families and friends and so on i know you guys are always very busy but uh, thanks for rajnish for uh, you know pulling things together in a uh, in a span of little little few days i i, I said I, i think me and dheeraj were actually discussing that whether we can pull it off but i think Uh, today has been fantastic uh, and i'm just uh, um, taking this time for our students to get uh, their questions around in their head but uh, dr jacob many of the photographs that you showed actually um, actually uh, reconcile many things in my mind because i have seen i mean me and my brother have seen our father going through and dr rajnish can tell you the condition of the haal hospital where he used to go and show and you are right that uh, you know as the as the patient progresses in the first decade the second decade is all about uh, managing the pain and and try to make the you know life a little easier but uh, starting yes. from the swelling to the swan duck uh, to the bent uh, z finger the trouble with holding the uh, pen because he had to sign the checks you know so so we have been through it all so so i can easily easily connect a very personal thing and and i think that is where um, you know the, the birth of this foundation was and i think what we are trying to do with dr dheeraj and the iit roper team and and the team now you can see at baptist as well is that if we can even touch even 1% of the population then i think we must have done our due credit uh, as a, as engineers as doctors and so on Uh, so with that i will just open it up dr dheeraj is it okay to open it up to our students i guess dr dheeraj is uh, is yeah is it okay to open up for our 
you are on mute if you are speaking dr deep yeah sorry my phone switched off i i went so yeah the questions uh, I, i think the students who are raising their hands they can sequentially ask questions so i think in first in line is yash uh, good evening panel uh, i am yash panchal uh, pursuing btech degree in biomedical engineering from sjs its college in Perth. sir mera question ye hai ki Uh, आपने सिर्फ नी रिप्लेसमेंट की बातें करी जो मतलब आर से रिलेटेड थी बट आर ए बेसिकली हर किसी भी पार्ट्स में हो सकता है ह्यूमन बॉडी के तो उसके लिए हम क्या कर सकते हैं सॉरी हिंदी Uh, major problems in mobility because the hands are used for day to day activities but they are so happy they still get around they do most of the things but when the knee is affected it's a weight bearing joint it affects mobility it puts them on a wheelchair and it can create great misery and distress for people who are as young as 40 45 so the knee being a weight bearing joint you improve the mobility and they will be absolutely overjoyed so that's why surgery also has developed in the area of knee replacement i don't know if dr abhijit has any comments yeah that's a good question that's put up by the speaker, uh, by the audience uh, i think uh, we are just not looking at knee we are looking at the patient as a whole see once mobility gets affected uh, it leads to a kind of psychological depression in these patients we have to look at their minds as well so loss of mobility loss of livelihood job this creates a kind of a vicious cycle in their life and they go into depression at least getting them to do mobility putting them into some job getting them back into the society that is very essential so in india majority of the joints affected by rheumatoid are knee joints of course hands and other things but we in the western society we see some of the hips getting more involved but in india what as a population we see coming to our clinics we see more of knee joints and disability more because of knee as sir says as dr jacob says i think hand and other joints it is manageable it is they accommodate themselves they learn new skills the new ways to go about daily lives but once knee is involved it's just either on the wheelchair or bedridden and knee replacement does a magic you see in 3 months they're up and about and running and doing their jobs it's it's a kind of a, a miracle for them in their lives if you speak to people who have undergone knee replacements after rheumatoid damage burnt out rheumatoids knees they are excellent they are very happy they are happy to talk to other patients motivate other rheumatoid people to get the surgeries done we have a lot of patients that dr jacob sends and they are extremely grateful to us they you know they see us as gods but i think we have done just a small piece of work for them in their lives getting them back on their legs so that's my answer to all of you thank you sir yeah uh, yeah angus you may go ahead please all right sir uh, a very good evening dr jacob and the panel uh, my name is amit kivari and i'm an intern medical student at uh, government medical college rashi uh, dr jacob uh, what do you think uh, what part of history taking is the most crucial aspect when it comes to dealing with uh, important heart patients uh, the important period is the duration if someone comes with two weeks of arthritis you don't think of rheumatoid arthritis and uh, right, if they they need to you need to consider a rheumatoid if it crosses 6 weeks and then you need to quickly rule out other things like psoriasis ibd inflammatory bowel disease you need to ask them if they have diarrhea vomiting sorry diarrhea bloody diarrhea uh, mouth ulcers which is seen in crohn's disease bloody diarrhea which is seen in ulcerative colitis some of them don't tell you this they think that it's for the gastroenterologist and they'll tell you only about the joints so then immediately you right. come to a diagnosis i had a patient who came to me with many years of uh, a couple of months of very aggressive arthritis and uh, in a busy opd I looked about over him and I didn't find any skin issues and he was not responding to treatment then I asked him do you have any other problem he said yeah I have a small patch of psoriasis on my abdomen and you know even at an experienced uh, phys- physician I just missed the psoriasis because uh, he didn't highlight it it was a very small patch so make sure you rule out all these other things and you should don't wait for uh, deformities wait when you see these equally symmetrically or equal uh, both hands uh, jo- swollen joints uh, fever early morning stiffness more than 1 hour Think of rheumatoid arthritis, especially if you ruled out the other differentials. So the most important part of diagnosis is history. Someone famously said, "Listen to the patient; he will tell you the diagnosis." Right, sir. Uh, so, also, uh, do you believe uh, uh, doing the pedigree analysis of families with multiple cases of rheumatoid arthritis 
uh, can can be can prove to be the solution for the early detection of uh, rheumatoid arthritis in, in the other members. Sorry, actually, uh, I didn't get that question. There was some break in the voice. Uh, can you? Uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah. Can you speak a little slower? Right, sir. Then? Right, sir. So, so, do you believe uh, doing the pedigree analysis of families with multiple cases of rheumatoid arthritis? uh can be a, can be a solution for early detection of rheumatoid arthritis yeah it's not a good idea because there are people who have uh, ccp antibodies even within right. family members who have no symptoms and uh, we treat patients who have symptoms i actually have a couple right. of patients who just have anti ccp antibodies they are so stressed out they did it in a master checkup and they and they are so anxious so we don't do it for anybody it's not a the good thing about rheumatoid arthritis i should say in the, with modern treatment is it's not life threatening overall life span is cut by about 5 to 10 years because of uh, uh, multiple uh, the multiple other uh, systems in, uh, involvement what i'm trying to say is that uh, even if you don't treat someone who's just got the antibodies um, nothing is lost time is not lost you need to act when the inflammation starts so what i would say is pedigree analysis unlike uh, degenerative diseases where you or uh, malignancies Uh, genetic malignancies where you can actually intervene earlier with scanning and screening and probably operate for people who have genetic malignancies rheumatoid arthritis you can actually uh, don't even test them don't even do it on a package testing test them when they have symptoms i have patients who come to me saying should i check my daughter should i check my son i tell them don't check it because your son or daughter who's maybe 20 now will have no symptoms for the next 20 years but you will die of depression in the next 20 years so don't i don't recommend none of us rheumatologists recommend any analysis for uh, family members unless they have symptoms if they have symptoms please do right so uh, so i have uh, i have another question for you uh, do so do you believe uh, using next generation of gene sequencing to analyze genetic variants in rheumatic disease can be a solution for early detection of rheumatoid arthritis which can for the improve the prognosis of the disease i mean uh, early detection as i said is based on symptoms uh, oh. you can use uh, i am not very familiar with the uh, uh, genetic tests but uh, as right. i said um, that's not going to help us in diagnosis you, uh, if you looked at the ular criteria or the acr ular criteria you need to correlate with all the symptoms it's always symptoms uh, that's right, why sir. I, sir, but i i believe a gene sequencing can give us a fair idea about the susceptible genes which are you know majorly responsible for the development of rheumatoid yes. arthritis these are all in research uh, laboratories people who go ahead with gvas testing genome wide testing right. now you can do it in the market is available uh, genomic testing is available but as i said it leads to more of anxiety it's not going to give you an early diagnosis it's going right. to give you an early onset of depression uh, mm -hmm. uh, and specifically unlike malignancies where you need to do gvas and other uh, genomic testing on neurodegenerative diseases in rheumatoid arthritis even though these things are available it's better not to do it if the patient has no symptoms that's uh, that's my take on it right thank you thank you so much sir So on this account, can I just ask uh, Dr. Sindhu and Dr. Vinita for any inputs uh, that they have got from the questions or anything that they have in their mind before we take the next set of questions? Is that okay, Dr. Sindhu first, and then Dr. Vinita? Is that okay? Um, uh, no, not really. I think Dr. Jacob uh, about covered uh, most of what uh, we do in the lab. Um, like he said, the we uh, ourselves started most of these tests only. maybe 2 3 years ago till then we were outsourcing to other labs which are which is readily available because we are in bangalore but it would be difficult when uh, we are not in a city people are not in a city so yeah something easier to do would be good yeah thank you that's why technology can help in when technology can make it uh, easier point of care testing of course all these have to be validated you can't just bring out a kit tomorrow all these have to be validated that's where technology really plays a role in quick and early diagnosis thank you i think uh, next asta if you may uh, good then... evening sir my name is asta kalita third year chemical engineering student so my question is that you once mentioned that a uh, golden uh, gold uh, knee replacement cap is also being used although it's being expensive but it uh, it is also one of the hardest materials so it's being used so i just wanted to know about its application ratio means how much it is being used although it's being expensive dr abhijit could please take that question 
Yeah, yeah, I'll take that. Uh, first of all, gold, as Dr. Jacob mentioned, it's not gold, and the material is not so expensive. It's just an add-on, maybe ten thousand rupees more than the regular uh, standard implant that the cobalt chromium alloy. Uh, gold is not is a titanium nitrobium niobium nitride coating. It is a surface modification of the cobalt chromium. It's a ceramic coating that is developed onto these implants. Ceramic being very hard, better wettability. it does the job for preventing wear and tear otherwise uh, as of the latest literature registry data both have done well cobalt chromium has a long run history of uh, usage almost 30 years 30 35 years uh, gold is relatively new 5 years we have to see into the future how this does see every new technology comes in it needs it has a latent phase where acceptability is needed then we need to see how well it does in patients once we have put them into the patients has, has it performed as good as the previous implant only then when, then we can compare both the implants as of now if i want to do a gold knee or a cobalt knee cobalt chrome knee, knee i would choose a cobalt chrome over the gold because we have not seen that for a long run as surgeons so that is it's only a new surface modification new developed technology we have to see it in the, into the future how it does but it's not very expensive it's pretty much affordable as per the nppa guidelines uh, by the government it is it comes into the bracket of the nppa which is about 75 to 80000 rupees i think the gold mean and only few companies market it so it's still into we need to look at it into the future uh, fine so i'd like to invite satya हेलो या हाय सर आई एम हर्षा आई एम अ फाइनल ईयर स्टूडेंट मेजरिंग इन इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स सो माय क्वेश्चन इज इज हैविंग अ हाई लेवल ऑफ लैक्टिक एसिड इन द बॉडी विल आई मीन लीड टू आर्थराइटिस आई एम नॉट अवेयर ऑफ एनीथिंग टू विद लैक्टिक एसिड इट इज बीइंग एन इन्फ्लेमेटरी डिजीज इट इज नो कनेक्शन वी डोंट यूज लैक्टिक एसिड टू मॉनिटर और ट्रीट रोमेटॉइड आर्थराइटिस I'm not sure if there's any experimental. Uh, are you asking the question because of any experimental information that you come across? Uh, no, sir. Like uh, one of my relatives, like uh, with a history of IBD, uh, when he went uh, for test, uh, when he uh, has like uh, I mean swelling in his hands, he was like uh, diagnosed with uh, uh, arthritis, and in the test, uh, like uh, he got uh, high, I mean high percentage of lactic acid in his blood. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Dr. Sindhilina can uh, give us some inputs on this. I think lactic acid is mainly uh, uh, goes up with the infections. So probably this patient also had an infection. So it has no correlation with rheumatoid arthritis. What do you think, Dr. Sindhilina? Yeah, I mean we we also I mean uh, don't uh, don't do it for rheumatoid arthritis for sure. I have not read anything about it either. I have not seen. Nobody's talked to me about it. So I, I mean I. I, I don't think there's a correlation that we see or we look for. Actually, we don't look for. It. Yeah, lactic acid is done in uh, many panels uh, when a patient comes into the emergency uh, because many patients come with fever. You can have rheumatoid arthritis causing fever. You can have infections causing fever. So if the lactates are high, some of the emergency doctors tend to quickly start antibiotics. So it's not nothing to do with rheumatoid. If you can understand what I'm saying, it's got nothing to do with rheumatoid. It's an associated condition a rheumatoid patient may come with. So, Jai, you may ask question. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, panel. I'm uh, Jai Prakash Guram. I am third year medical student from Amphosis Medical College, Pune. So, my question is, you showed up those uh, writing aids which patients usually use. So, my question is, those writing aids and other aids which people wear they wear in their hands. How how many patients? Rheumatoid arthritis patients eventually use them. Like how frequently it has been used? Yeah, I would, I would, uh, I will just answer briefly and ask Dr. Vinita to give inputs. So what we find is there's a great level of ignorance among our patients. Uh, they don't uh, think that these facilities are available. So that's where awareness is very important. I would ask Dr. Vinita to give her inputs. Yeah, I think a second. 
what Dr. Jacob said. Actually, Armed Forces has a huge department for um, uh, artificial limb centers, what you guys call it. And um, all these aids yes, are quite easily available. In fact, probably one of the biggest centers that started off in India. So in terms of usage, I think um, in the, somebody was asking me in the comments, we were having a discussion. So using the aids, I think, is a very um most people see it as a as a disability people don't really like to use it or come out in public with it but nowadays we see a lot more usage of these devices uh in the cities rather than you know in the rural sites uh, so i think it's becoming a little more popular once people start using it and they see that it's easier on their joints causes less pain eventually I think they are more willing to use it. So giving them that trial is, I think, something that's important. Uh, so, sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah. Adding on to my question, so is there like is there any study which has proven that using AIDS has definitely reduced the progression of the disease, or has it the progression been the same? So when we say AIDS, no, we don't mean it has an impact on the disease. Our aids are usually meant to support the joint, meant to sort of be customized so that a particular function is achieved. So the writing aid is meant to achieve writing or like uh, Sir was saying before, trying to sign on the check, you know. You're trying to achieve a function. You're not trying to sort of decrease inflammation at the joint. Sure, all your splints will keep the joint in a more feasible position. Over time, it will help with deformity correction there are studies on that um there are a lot of rehab related studies on decreasing deformities but not aids per se so that would be orthotics yeah thank you ma'am thank you sir can i add on can i add on uh, so as an orthopedic surgeon i would come here and see when we see deformities in the hand wrist wrists are so involved it gets so painful after some time just like the knee joints so we have a surgical option of fusing them also, fuse the joints in a mobile, in a functional position and make it more comfortable for the patients to hold a glass, to hold things. Once you fuse it, the joint pain is gone. Upper limbs are so mobile in the sense, the shoulder, the elbow, there are so many joints in the upper limb. They can uh, kind of adapt themselves with one or two fused joints. Uh, a replacement would not be a sensible thing to do in so many multiple joints, but a fusion would do a better job for the wrist, I say wrist or elbow replacements are there, which we do regularly, elbow and shoulder replacements. But for the wrist, I think a fusion will do a very good job for these patients and take away their pain and make them more functional. And as I said, ortho orthotics will keep the position in a position where the joints get arthritic in a position of ease rather than in a deformed and unusable position for the patients. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Shubhi, please. Good uh, evening, panel. This is uh, and I'm a third year BTEC bioengineering student from VIT Gopal University. My question is that DMARDs and steroids are used for the early detection of RA. So, if the patient is not responding to it, is there any other way to control? Yes, um, I'll take that question. Basically, steroids are uh, used only when uh, there is a lot of inflammation and uh, disability to get on with daily activities of living. Uh, but we don't use it isolated. We don't use it in isolation. We use it along with the disease modifying drugs. And then as the disease modifying drugs work in about six to eight weeks, we withdraw the steroids. So this is what Dr. Nathaj alluded to called bridging therapy. Within two months or three months, you should take off the steroids. Then you come to a stage where you have to keep adding treatments. You don't wait for one drug to work. So we call it a multiple uh, DMARD approach or uh, we add multiple drugs uh, over a course of few months. And uh, the reason is that the patients get f much better and then we can, after about a year, start bringing down the number of DMARDs uh, very gradually and reaching a, uh, a stage of the lowest number of drugs, but with the best efficiency to avoid side effects. Coming to the point where if they don't work on DMARDs, we have what's called biologic DMARDs, uh, 
they're all act at the cytokine levels. So you have uh, inflammatory chemicals or interleukins and cytokines which are actually driving the disease. There are multiple cytokines, they're called T1 necrosis factor, interleukin 6, interleukin 1. These are all cytokines which drive the disease. So you have blockers for these uh, very, very latest uh, technology treatments, uh, anti-cytokine therapies they are called. So when you take those drugs, they much more potent than the, uh, the conventional DMARDs. Why is it we don't use it upfront? Because they are more toxic and no patient uh, would want to start a toxic treatment when he's in the early stage of the disease. But when someone has gone far into the illness about two years or three years and the conventional DMARDs are not working, then they would themselves say, please give me something stronger doctor. And we would also counsel them on the side effects and very carefully monitor them and start the stronger what we call cytokine therapies. Injectables are available, tablets are available. And nowadays the costs have come down, but that's not an excuse for us to use it. We look at the response of the patients to conventional drugs. Thank you so much, sir. Conventional drugs have been found to be safe over 30 years of use. So we are all pro-conventional drugs. We use biologics only when the patient reaches a point of uh, too much side effect to the conventional or he, he's not responding to it, which is, I would say, 20% of our patients. Dr. I don't see any other questions. Thank you, panelists. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, uh, Dr. Das, you can then close the session uh, with the thank you remarks. Yeah. So, okay, because I, I see it's already 7.35 or 7.40 now in the evening on a Saturday, so wouldn't like to hold you guys any longer. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Rajnish, you... Yeah, yeah uh, thanks, Mitesh. Uh, I think uh, we've started a nice new journey. And as you see, Baptist team is quite eager and uh, 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 to uh, carry on with your, uh, carry along your uh, uh, aims and objectives of reaching out to the people affected by rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, actually yesterday when Dr. Jacob told me, let's do a, something different. And uh, we said, okay, let's go for it. And uh, after we had the talk, actually today he would manage to uh, convince Dr. Sindhu, Dr. Abhijit and Dr. Vinita that uh, uh, please join and they said, okay, if it is Rajneesh, better to tolerate him for one year, one, one hour than to tolerate him. He will leave, he won't leave us. So Team Baptist is always with you and you know we are all available and uh, as always, Baptist is the best. So thank you for this opportunity and uh, thanks Dr. Sindhu, Dr. Abhijit and Dr. Vinita and uh, obviously Jacob, uh, he wanted me to be there because, because uh, he said, Rajneesh, I want you to be around me. Okay. <laughs> so thanks a lot. It was a nice session and I think uh, it, uh, I really enjoyed it and I think it was quite interactive and it was a job well done. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Rajneesh, or famously as we call him in our childhood friends as Ronnie. So uh, I, I think thank you, Rajneesh, as always. And thank you, Dr. Jacob, Dr. Sindhu, Dr. Vinita. And I can see Dr. Abhijit almost walking and maybe going to some place. So wouldn't like to hold you any longer. Uh, but I think this, this has been fantastic. And I think the new format, I think, which was curated maybe just uh, 24 or 30 hours ago, has really played out well. And we couldn't have asked for anything better. I think it is much beyond our expectations. So on behalf of IIT Roper, Eduthon and Aidkriya, and on behalf of the cohort of students here, I think, um, what, el what else can I say? Thank you. I think is the least that we can say. So thank you for thank inviting you. us. Thank you. We are happy to be Thank you for giving us. Uh, uh, pleasure. Thank you and have a nice week. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.